back. So far in chapter 12, we have covered the definition of rotational kinetic energy, the definition of center of mass, the definition of rotational inertia. We've introduced torque. We've taken a look at the calculation of torques and the application of the conditions of static equilibrium uh, to static equilibrium problems. The two remaining subjects in this chapter are, what are they? Oh, the dynamical or the rotational form of Newton's second law. We have yet to look at that. And angular momentum, specifically problems involving the conservation of angular momentum. So those, are, those last two topics are in your second assignment. And that's the last thing we'll do before we talk about gravity for the remaining days in the semester. So in order to introduce the rotational form of Newton's second law for a rigid object, I first want to revisit torque and talk about another way of visualizing the torque. So here's some sort of beam sticking out of a building. Here's a rod supporting the beam, something hanging from the end of the beam. And for, for, for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to put the origin at the bottom end of the beam here. So these could be my X and Y axes. I guess I've already drawn the, the Y axis here. I will compute torques about this point. Well, really just one torque. And I'm interested in the torque on this beam due to the tension in this rope. So I will draw a vector representing the tension. And I put the tail of the vector at the place where the force is actually applied. Because remember, in this chapter, we do care about where the force is applied. OK, instead of T for tension, I'll just label this F. This is the force vector F. And maybe you can immediately see that R perp would be this line segment here that's from the pivot to the line of action. Now, I could do the thing where I extend the line of action to make it a little easier to see. But this is definitely R perp right here. I'll do another dotted line or dashed line. And I'll call this R perp. Now remember, this angle right here. So uh, this, this may be R perp, but the R vector points from the origin to the place where the force is applied. This is the actual R vector. And since this is the force vector, I could call this the angle theta. Theta is the angle between R and F. And we know that torque equals RF sine theta. And if you look at the R and the sine theta, remember R is the hypotenuse of this right triangle. If you take the hypotenuse and multiply by the sine of theta, you get the opposite side. So everything's consistent here. We could rewrite this as R perp F. The fact that this works means I, I labeled R perp appropriately. There is, however, another way of thinking about this. And let me do that right now. I really should have drawn this vector longer. So if you'll excuse me, I'm going to redraw the force vector and have it terminate down here so that my next step is a little clearer. What I'm going to do is resolve the force vector into components. And you see how this is the direction of the R vector? I would like to have a component of F perpendicular to the R vector. So let me do that right now. I'm making a right triangle out of the original F vector. And one of, one of the components of the F vector will be perpendicular to the R vector. And the other will, other will be parallel. See how this next component is parallel to the R vector? OK, so I've resolved the force vector into components. And the, the obvious choice of names here would be this is the perpendicular component of F, F perp. And this is the parallel component, meaning this is parallel to the R vector. Now, uh, do you see how this angle is 90 minus that angle? So these two have to add up to 90. But in a right triangle, the two non-right angles also have to add up to 90. And that means that this angle is the same as this angle. You can also see that from alternate interior angles. See how this is parallel to that. We've got what they call a transversal in geometry. So alternate interior angles. This is also theta. So check out this right triangle. F perp right here is the side of this right triangle opposite theta. So I could take the hypotenuse of F multiplied by the sine of theta and I would have the opposite side. In other words, F perp. So F perp is F sine theta. And that means if we go back to our definition for torque, torque is R F sine theta. And I've chosen to put parentheses around these 
to emphasize that what we're talking about is actually F perp. So you could visualize the torque as either the length of the R vector times the perpendicular component of the force, that's R F perp, or as R perp F. In other words, apply the sine of theta to either vector and extract uh, a perpendicular component. And the reason I'm doing this is so that we'll have an easier time developing the rotational form of Newton's second law, which we should do right now. Let's see here. I always have to choose some arbitrary shape that I imagine is spinning around an axis. So how's about we go with the square this time? This is supposed to be a rigid object. Now, I don't know why you'd, you'd have a, a square, a flat square object rotating about an axis through its center. Let's put it through the center. And actually, it's not necessary that it be the center of mass for this discussion, but that's okay. I'll just stick with that for now. <clears throat> okay, so this whole thing is rotating about this axle. And let's take a top view. So now we're looking down on this flat square object. By the way, flat, there's a fancy word for that a laminar object. So a piece of pottery on a clay wheel, that would not be laminar because it's clearly three-dimensional. But if it's pretty much flat, you can call it a laminar object. So the axle's through the, the center and the whole thing is rotating in this direction according to my, my picture up here. Now, why is this thing rotating? I always have trouble coming up with concrete examples, but there could be any number of forces being applied to the various particles in this mass. I don't know, maybe air drag? You know, what if this is a picture of part of a propeller on a plane? You've definitely got forces between the propeller and the air as that uh, the propeller blades whip through the air. Uh, maybe it's a piece of a, a larger machine and there are gears pushing on it. That's a good one. Obviously, you wouldn't have a square gear, but there, there could be any number of outside forces being applied to various parts of this spinning object. And that means there will be various outside torques. And I would like to calculate the net torque on this entire object due to all those individual torques. And then we can express that torque in terms of something else. And the equation we get will look a lot like F equals MA. So let's just imagine that we've chopped this laminar object into, I don't know, a thousand little pieces and labeled them M1, M2, et cetera, all the way up to M1000. And this is the ith mass. M sub i. And let's consider all the possible forces on this little piece. Well, first of all, as I mentioned, there could be forces from the outside. If this is part of a propeller, maybe there's air drag on this particular part of the propeller. Maybe there are the teeth of a gear somewhere else in the machine, in the machine uh, pushing on this piece of another gear, which I'm drawing as a square. But don't don't forget that there also have to be forces between this particle and the rest of the particles, well, specifically the nearby particles in the object. You can go on YouTube and watch the slow-mo guys get a, a compact disc spinning so fast that it shatters into pieces. And that's because as the CD is spinning around and around, every piece of the CD is in circular motion. And the only, or the only possible source of the centripetal force to keep them all accelerating towards the center would be the interparticle forces, the forces between particles within the CD. And there's a limit to how great those, those forces can be. So if you spin the thing too fast, the whole thing just kind of rips apart. So they're, you know, I don't want to draw it because I don't want to clutter the picture, but the very next door piece of this uh, propeller blade, let's say, if, if they're, you know, 20 nanometers apart, like the, the sort of spacing you would expect between atoms or molecules, then there's going to be some sort of electromagnetic interaction between them. Of course, there's forces between the particles. That's what holds the whole thing together. So we're looking at the, the net uh, result of all those forces. And I'm just going to draw that force arbitrarily. Suppose it goes off in, in this direction while this whole thing is spinning. And you may be thinking, wait a minute. If this thing is spinning about that axis, which it is by assumption, then this particle is actually executing circular motion, which is true. And maybe you're thinking that means the force should point towards the center. And you know what? You're right. <laughs> this picture is bogus. I really should have 
if anything, the, uh, the force vector should point that way because there must be a component towards the center. How about that? I, I was going to pose a question that you might be thinking or at, wondering and then reject it, but it turns out it was a valid question. Okay, that's gonna bother me. So I think what I'll do very quickly is redraw that. Here's our square object. <clears throat> And the whole thing's rotating about that axle, axis. And every piece of the propeller is in circular motion. And so at the very least, pretend that's a circle with the center here. At the very least, there has to be a component of the force on this particle, which is towards the center. There has to be because of the centripetal acceleration. Now, there may also be a component of force that way in the tangential direction. What if this thing is moving in a circle, but also speeding up, right? If the, whole, if the whole laminar object is accelerating angularly, then there may also be a tangential force. I will imagine that it points in this direction. And that means that the net force here, I would just close the, the polygon, use the parallelogram rule. Usually I went with the triangle rule, but okay. So if I'm going to call this little piece of mass M sub I, it's the ith piece of mass in this laminar object, then this force would be F sub I. It's the net force. It's understood F means F net, the net force on the ith piece of mass. And since I've already resolved it into components, uh, if I were to place my origin, let's say I want to calculate torques about the axis. That's the natural place about which to calculate torques. Well, then my R vector goes from the origin to where the force is applied. The R vector would be here. This is the component of the force, which is perpendicular to R. So I'm going to call this the perpendicular component of the ith force. In other words, F sub I perp. Does that make sense? This is the perpendicular component of the net force on this particle. And that net, that net force could come from a whole bunch of different forces. Forces from the other particles in this propeller blade, uh, forces of form, excuse me, forces from the air drag as this thing whips through the atmosphere or forces from other gears, belts, pulleys, whatever. Okay, well, you, you can uh, recall from chapter eight, we had those RTZ axes, remember that? Or, or was it TRZ? Yeah, I think I, the order was TRZ in chapter eight. And we applied F equals MA along each of those axes simultaneously. Usually the R axis was the interesting one, but right now I'm looking at the tangential axis. So for the ith particle, let's apply Newton's second law along the tangential axis for the ith particle. So I'll say the sum of the forces on the ith particle in the tangential direction, but look, Right now, I'm using different notation. Instead of calling it the t-axis, I'm calling it the perpendicular direction. So this really is the, the net force on the ith particle in the t-direction. And hopefully recall, that's equal to mass times tangential acceleration. So we're talking about the ith mass times the tangential component of the acceleration of the ith, ith mass. So the order of the subscripts, you know, that's not really important, but I'm choosing it to do it this way. I'm saying, Let's look at the acceleration of the ith particle, specifically along the t axis. Okay, now recall these equations. Remember, arc length is r times theta for circular motion. Tangential velocity is r times angular velocity. And lastly, tangential acceleration is r times angular acceleration. Aha! So I can rewrite the tangential acceleration as follows. The tangential acceleration of the ith mass is simply uh, the distance between that ith mass and the axis of rotation, which I'm calling r sub i, because it's the r vector for the ith mass. So that's r sub i times alpha. Right? So instead of just writing tangential acceleration, I'm putting r times angular acceleration. And you'll note, I did not put a subscript i next to the alpha. And that is because by assumption, this is a rigid object. This is not a clump of pizza dough that can stretch and deform while it's spinning in the air. This is not a bunch of jello 
This is not the protoplanetary disk of a, uh, an early solar system with the gas that can move past itself and the whole thing's changing diameter and shape. This is a rigid object, so the, the relative positions of all the particles are fixed. Think of a rock, mm, even a, a wooden disk. Those are rigid enough to satisfy uh, the assumptions we're making here. And that is why I, I only need a single value of alpha, because if everything's rotating together, then every piece of this propeller or whatever it is has the same angular velocity. It's all rotating at the same RPM or radians per second. And it also has the same angular acceleration. So the reason we can use a single value for alpha is because we're emphasizing this is a rigid object. Okay, here comes, here comes the clever part. We've gotten this far. We don't change the equality by multiplying by the same quantity on both sides. So I'm gonna multiply both sides of this equation by r sub i. That's the distance of the ith particle from the axis of rotation. So what I've got now is r f perp for the ith particle, r sub i, f sub i, perp. And let's see here. I, I've got an r sub i and an r sub i. So this is actually m sub i, r sub i squared, alpha. Aha. Why am I doing this? Doesn't this remind you of something? This is how you calculate the rotational inertia of a point particle. And check this out. I was just talking about this a moment ago. Where is that? Right here. One way of expressing the torque on a, a single particle would be the, what is it? Where did I write that? Right here, yeah. R times F perp, rather than R perp F, you can also visualize it as R F perp. Okay, so this would be the, I'm gonna call this torque sub I. This is the torque on the entire object due to the force applied to the ith mass. It's, it's just one of the torques. We're gonna sum up all the torques. Any, any piece of mass belonging to this propeller, let's say, that has a force applied to it is going to result in a torque on the entire object. So this is the torque just due to that one force on that one particle or that one net force m sub i r sub i squared alpha. And then of course the idea is to sum over i. Sorry, you can't see that. Uh, sum this equation up over every single particle in your object. So let me do that over here. As long as we sum both sides of the equation, that should be valid. Sum over i of, uh, and I'll, I'll do this, I'll write it in brackets, m sub i r sub i squared alpha, and then I can do this, just to help you um, conceptualize what's happening here. This is the torque due to the forces on the first particle, plus the torque due to the forces on the second particle, et cetera. And then what do we have here? We've got um, M1 R1 squared alpha plus M2 R2 squared alpha plus M3 R3 squared alpha, can we simplify this expression? Every term here has this, the same quantity alpha attached to it. So you know what to do next. Let's factor that out. So on the right side, we've got M1 R1 squared plus M2 R2 squared plus dot, dot, dot. Af uh, out of that entire expression, we've factored out alpha. And now you recognize this is the prescription for calculating the moment of inertia of the entire thing. Take each mass that belongs to this propeller blade, multiply by the square of its distance from the axis of rotation. Repeat that for every particle and add it up. That's the definition of the rotational inertia of the propeller blade. Now on the other side here, this is the, the total torque on the propeller due to forces on the first particle. This is the total torque on the propeller due to the forces on the second particle, et cetera. But what I can do is, is break this whole thing into two categories. This is gonna be the sum of all the, let me put the summation notation there, that's sloppy. This is gonna be the sum of all the internal torques plus the sum of all the external torques. Internal torques are torques due to forces between particles. So I was talking about the electromagnetic interaction between nearby particles that are what? 20, 30 nanometers apart. Uh, 
those interparticle forces contribute what I would call internal torques to the total torque on the entire propeller blade. These torques are due to all the outside forces, like the gears or the teeth of another gear pushing on this gear. I, I know I keep switching back between examples that I've been talking about a propeller blade. Now I'm imagining this is a, a gear in a machine and there's another gear pushing on it. Whatever it is, forces from the outside contribute to external torques. Forces between particles belonging to your gear contribute to internal torques. And it's not hard to show that very often these sum to zero. Just like the internal forces, when we look at um, F equals MA applied to an object, um, the F on the left side of F equals MA ends up being the external force because all the internal forces cancel in pairs. That's the Newton's third law thing about how forces come in uh, action reaction pairs. Okay, so I'm not going to show that. You would see that in a more advanced mechanics book, but hopefully it seems plausible to you. And instead of using the summation notation, let's just call it ex the net external torque. It's understood this is the net external torque. And we recognize this as the rotational inertia. And there it is. There is the rotational form of Newton's second law. This is a dynamical result. So compare this to F equals MA. F equals MA is what you would use when you're not concerned about the spatial extent of an object. Like when you throw the baseball. If you're not really concerned about how the baseball rotates, you just want to know what happens to the center of mass of the baseball. Is it going to move in a parabola? Or is there air drag that will change that trajectory? Then you talk about the net force on the baseball and all those internal forces between particles within the baseball, they cancel in pairs. So this net force would come from air drag, gravity, et cetera. And this acceleration is really the acceleration of the center of mass. This is the mass of the entire baseball. Well, now we've got an expression that will tell us how the object rotates. If you have a rigid object, all you have to do is look at the net external torque on the object. And that's equal to rotational inertia times angular acceleration. See how we've got two inertial terms here and, and two different acceleration terms. We've replaced force by torque. So it's very analogous to F equals MA. And that should help you uh, remember the equation. So it's important to recognize this is only applicable for rigid, and I'm going to put in parentheses laminar. Now, you know what? Because you actually can apply this equation even to things that are not flat, like a, a drum a rotating drum, which is not a flat object, you could still use it. Yeah, rigid objects rotating about a fixed axis. You see, the reason why I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit here is because this, um, this equation really only applies to a, a rather restricted class of problems. Fortunately, it's the problems that we're interested in. But if you were to, to take like, um, Take your textbook, put a rubber band, a, a strong rubber band around the book to keep it from flapping open, and then just chuck it into the air. Hey, do it right now if you want. Well, don't destroy your book. But you can imagine that your book, much like a football thrown by uh, somebody who doesn't know how to throw a football, like myself, it doesn't have uh, a very regular rotation. It'll kind of flop around and tilt while it's in mid-flight. That's, that's a much more complicated motion this equation is useless for describing that kind of motion. So we're really talking about things like automobile wheels, which are held in place on their axles and forced to rotate about a particular axis, or a disc rolling down a ramp, which we'll look at in a moment. So that's, that's the sort of problem for which you can use this equation. But at the very least, it's got to be a rigid object. It can't be jello-y. So why don't we apply this now in the solution of two problems? As a matter of fact, both of the problems I'm going to look at right now have already been solved in these videos. Previously, we solved these problems using the principle of energy conservation. So let's go back and do the same thing now using dynamics. Remember, energy conservation, if, if you have the option, that's often the simplest way to solve problems. Energy is a scalar. It's easy to work with. When it comes to torque and forces, you have to worry about components of vectors. And I, I would say that in general, there's more to keep track of. But let's show that it can be done both ways. So here's the Atwood machine again. Remember, 
the pulley here is suspended to the ceiling or whatever. And these are unequal masses. Let's suppose that MA is more massive and currently the system is being supported, but we remove the supports and allow the masses to accelerate. We'd like to know just how fast this thing's going to be going right before it strikes the floor. Now, since we're talking about dynamics here, we're gonna look at how forces and torques produce acceleration. Once we know the acceleration using the dynamics, we can apply kinematics to get final velocity. Right? So first, first, you apply Newton's dynamics to get your accelerations, then you use the, the accelerations in your kinematics to find velocities or displacements. That's the general prescription here. So ultimately, we're looking for this. And as I mentioned, to get this, we first need acceleration. So let's solve for the accelerations. And I'm going to skip the, the business of the acceleration constraint because we've been over this so many times. If we pretend the string can't stretch, that string theory, then these two have to move at the same rate. And that means same speed, same acceleration. So there's really only one acceleration for these two. But this thing is going to start to spin, and it'll spin faster and faster as this moves faster. So we'll have to relate the linear acceleration of the masses to the angular acceleration of the pulley. All right, I'm going to start with some free body diagrams for mass B. That's easy. We've got the upward force of the tension. There's only one. Is there only one tension? Hmm. That's right. You see, hang on a second. I have to think about this. This is the first time we've run into this problem. Think about it. What's, what's the torque? If this, um, if this disc or pulley really does have rotational inertia, it's going to take a torque to get it to move. Where does that torque come from? Well, only the tension can produce torque because there's nothing else touching the pulley. And you can see that the, the clockwise torque from this tension must be greater than the counterclockwise torque from this tension if we're going to get this thing to turn. But look, they have the same lever arm. If we put the origin here for computing torques, this is our perp for the tension on the right, and this is our perp for the tension on the left. So when we go to calculate torques, if we made the assumption that the tensions were equal, we would find that the torques are equal. And there won't be any net torque if the clockwise tension torque balances the counterclockwise tension torque. So this is the first time we have to acknowledge unequal tensions. And that's because the pulley does have mass. Okay, so I'll call this tension T1. Gravity pulls down on mass B. Now, as far as mass A is concerned, gravity pulls down. I'll, I'll draw that vector a little bit longer. Sorry, that's pretty sloppy. This is just getting worse. Let me try that again. For mass A, here's my free body diagram. Gravity has to be the stronger force because we expect it to accelerate down. And then the, the tension that pulls back, I'll call it T2. So I already have one, two, three unknowns. When I write F equals MA for these two masses, I'm going to have three unknowns, two tensions and one acceleration. And then there's this third equation. I'll just say tau for torque. Or I could say, let's look at the mass of the pulley, really the rotational inertia of the pulley. And I'll say the, the net torque equals I alpha. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm actually writing the equation. I don't really know how to draw a free body diagram for the, the pulley. It's, it's really not the same thing. I guess what we could do is just draw the uh, R perps. That's R and R. And we've got T2 pulling down on the pulley and T1 also pulling down. And I went ahead and made T1 shorter because I expect there to be a net clockwise torque. Right, I guess you could call this a free body diagram, but usually the phrase free body diagram refers to a drawing just including forces where you've represented the object as a point particle. This is a little different because I was careful to put the tails of the vector at the place where the torques are actually applied. Okay, now I will write the equations. So for mass B, and do you remember the rule? You have the greatest likelihood of avoiding sign errors if you just choose the direction that you expect the object to accelerate and call that the positive direction. Since I'm expecting mass A to accelerate down and mass B to accelerate up, I will call up the positive direction for mass B. And that means T1 gets the plus sign, 
the weight of mass B gets the minus sign, and I will set that equal to mass B, is, or mass B times the acceleration of mass B. And again, no need to write a subscript B. I only need one symbol for acceleration because these two have to accelerate together. That's the acceleration constraint. Now for mass A, if I expect mass A to accelerate down, in order for these equations to be consistent, I now need to call down the positive direction. So gravity gets the plus sign for mass A. The tension gets the minus sign. And that's going to equal mass A times its acceleration, also A. And I don't have to worry about whether the signs match here because of this convention I'm using where whichever direction I expect it to accelerate, I call that the positive direction. OK, remember what we're solving for. We need the acceleration so we can find the speed at the end using kinematics. I've, I've now written two equations that have one, two, three unknowns. I could underline those. You can't solve two equations for three unknowns. I need a third equation. And of course, I get that from applying the rotational dynamics now to the mass of the pulley. So this is the first time in a video I'm using this new version, or it's like a, an analog of Newton's second law. It, it came from Newton's second law, right? When I did the business with F tangential equals MA tangential for each particle in your propeller blade or your gear, that was F equals MA, and then I summed it over the whole object. So it still comes from F equals MA, of course. We'll say that the net torque, the net external torque equals I alpha. So I guess I'm putting an extra step here because up here I didn't actually write F equals MA. I just plopped in the forces directly. Let's take a look here. Now, here's a very subtle point. Well, somewhat subtle. Normally, don't we consider clockwise torques negative? The torque from T2 is a clockwise torque on the pulley. So under normal circumstances, you would consider that a clockwise torque. But you can switch up that convention as you see fit as long as you're consistent. And in this particular problem, the motion of mass A downwards is associated with the clockwise motion of the pulley, right? If mass A is moving down, the pulley is actually moving clockwise. Similarly, if mass A's acceleration is down, so if it's moving down and speeding up, then the acceleration of the pulley is also clockwise. So in order to be consistent with signs, since I expect A to be a positive number, it's actually easier to choose the clockwise direction as the positive direction. So that's what I'm going to do now. Because the R vector for this torque is already perpendicular to the force, the torque is trivial. Just use R perp F, same thing for this torque. So I can directly write the clockwise torque is uh, lever arm times force, that's RT2. I'm giving that torque a, a plus sign. And then the counterclockwise torque is RT1. I'm just using R perp F. The radii here are already perpendicular to the forces. So that is the net torque, specifically it's the net torque about the center of the pulley. Okay, and I set that equal to the moment of inertia times alpha. Well, I'm using this general expression for moment of inertia. It's mass R squared with some arbitrary coefficient out front between zero and one. You've seen that, or you've seen me do that before. So arbitrary coefficient times MR squared, that's mass of the pulley times the square of the radius of the pulley times alpha. Okay, now. Let's, let's take one more look at, at the three equations we've written. How many unknowns do we have? One, two, three, no, oh, four. We've got four unknowns and three equations. Dang it, seems like we're going to need a fourth equation. So you can think of it that way. You've got four unknowns, you need a fourth equation. And here's where that fourth equation comes from. But remember that for unraveling without slipping, if you've got a, a pulley unwinding, or a string unwinding from a pulley, there's a relation you can use that looks exactly like the relation for um, the center of the motion of the center of mass of a rolling disc that's rolling without slipping, or uh, tangential velocity related to angular velocity, et cetera. So remember these relations? Uh, v equals R omega and A equals R alpha. 
these equations relate the rotational motion of the pulley to the translational motion of whatever's hanging from the pulley, right? If you know the speed of this thing, all you have to do is divide by the radius of the pulley to get the rotational speed of the pulley. Aha. So what I can do now, I'm looking for an R alpha. I've got two factors of R. Let's use one of those R's and write R, R alpha instead as A. And now you can see why it was more convenient to say that clockwise was positive because if we expect A to be positive, we expect alpha to be positive. So let's do, let's do the following. Let's divide this whole equation by R. Divide out the R because there's one in every term. And then we're, we're left with just R to the first power times alpha, and that would be A. So the torque equation says T2 minus T1 equals C times the mass of the pulley times A. One of the R's is gone. The remaining R combines with alpha to make the translational acceleration. Beautiful, because now if I number these two equations, I've got equation one, equation two, and equation three, do you see that we really have the same three unknowns throughout T1, T2, and A? T1, T2, and A. We can solve three equations for those three unknowns. Which, which uh, variable are we actually interested in, though? The whole point is to find the accelerations so that we can find the velocity via kinematics. We're not actually asked for the tension. So if this was an algebra class in high school, you've got a couple methods for eliminating the two variables you don't want. You could do a repeated substitution, you could use a, a, term, a determinant. Um, could you do it that way? Yeah, the, an aug augmented matrix, excuse me. Kramer's rule. Some of you have seen a variety of ways of solving linear, linear equations for the unknowns. But in this class, very often, there's a, a very direct way of solving for the one unknown that you want. Check it out. What if we just add these three equations together? Add all the left sides together add all the right sides together. We get lucky in this instance because do you see how we have a T2 and a negative T2? When you add those, they're gone. We've got a negative T1 here and a positive T1 here. When you add them up, they're gone. So let's just, I'm gonna write this symbolically as equation one plus equation two plus equation three. And let's see what we get. I'm running out of space here, but I think I can fit this. Like I said, or like I pointed out, all the T's cancel. Now I'm left with a positive mass A a negative mass B, and nothing gets contributed, contributed from the left side down here because both of these terms cancel. So I'm gonna factor out the G from these two terms and I get MA minus MB times G equals, now on the right side, every term shares A. So we can factor that out and we're left with MA plus MB plus M or C MP times A. Very cool because now we have our expression for the acceleration. I'm looking for a somewhat blank sheet of paper. This works. Solve for the acceleration. I find that it's the difference in the masses over the sum of the masses, including that coefficient in front of mass of the pulley, which reflects the distribution of the mass. So it still looks like our Atwood machine formula, right? Remember, for a massless pulley, this term is zero, and we do in fact recover the acceleration from early in the semester. Okay, lastly, let's use kinematics. This part's trivial, so I'll do it quickly. Now that we know the linear acceleration of this mass, let's use kinematics. Final speed squared minus initial speed squared is two times acceleration times displacement. Well, the displacement is just H units downward. Let's call down positive for this part of the problem. And if we start from rest, the initial velocity is zero. So I'll just put dot, dot, dot. V1 squared is two times the acceleration times the height through which mass A moves. And lastly, V1 would you take the square root of both sides. And we've got two times the difference over the sum. And you know what? This is looking familiar because we just did this the other day using energy conservation. But I think that time, I, I may have written this in terms of the moment of inertia. I forget. Remember, moment of inertia is C mass of the pulley R squared, which means 
this term, CMP, would be I over R squared. Sorry. Yeah, so it's actually easier just to leave it like this. It's not going to look any cleaner if we write this as I over R squared. Okay, I sure hope this is the same expression that we had. A few days ago when I solved this, not with dynamics, I didn't use torque equals I alpha. I didn't write down the forces. I didn't write down, I didn't write down Newton's second law. Instead, I wrote down energy at the end is equal to energy at the beginning. And I wound up with the same speed. And I've made this point many times, so I'm probably boring you to death, but should we be surprised that you get the same result either way? Is it magic? Well, that depends on whether you think the fundamental theorem of calculus is magical. Because we use the fundamental theorem of calculus to go from F equals MA to the conservation of energy. So if one works, the other has to work to the extent that the fundamental theorem of calculus is legit. Okay, so there's, there's one problem using torque equals I alpha. Let's look at one more, which has also already been solved using energy conservation. Let's look once again at a circular or spherical rigid object rolling down a ramp so that it starts at a height H. The ramp's got an inclination theta. I'll use the, the term delta X for the total displacement parallel to the ramp from top to bottom. And we'd like to find the speed at the bottom. So I can label some times here. T0 is when the ball or disc is released. And T1, I'll just say, is when it reaches the bottom. And we'd like, we would like to know the speed at the bottom. We've already analyzed this problem using energy conservation. Let's do it in an arguably more difficult way using the, the dynamics. Sometimes you can't use energy conservation or it's actually simpler to use the dynamical starting point. Now, a naive guess would be root 2GH, right? Because we found that if there's no non-conservative forces on a point particle, then it doesn't matter if it falls through height H or slides without friction down through a height H, it's still root 2GH. But we already know that when this thing gets to the bottom, some of its initial gravitational energy is now tied up in the rotation. Not all of the gravitational energy that was present at the beginning is associated with the translational kinetic energy. So the speed's actually gonna be lower at the bottom than root t, 2 gh. How much? Well, we can determine that with uh, the dynamics that we have now. So this is not proven in your book. I'm not gonna prove it now because uh, well, off the top of my head, I wouldn't know how. I'd have to review it, but also because there's, there's a fair bit of algebra and use of vectors and the cross product. So let's just state it without proof that for a rigid object, you can analyze the, the total motion because what's this disk actually doing? It's rolling as it translates. You can separate the motion into two components. The translation of the center of mass, which in this case is the geometric center of the ball or disk, and rotation about the center of mass. So we're going to apply torque equals I alpha about the center of mass and find what's going on with the rotation. And then we'll look at the translation as if this thing is just a point particle. Okay, so I've, I've obviously decided to call down the ramp the X axis. And let's start with F equals MA along the X axis. Some of the forces in the X direction is, let's just use uh, capital M for the mass of the disc or ball. Mass times, this is linear acceleration, not alpha. And I guess I'll go ahead and draw the forces here. So I've blown up the picture here. And not only will I draw the forces, I'm going to pay attention to where the forces are applied. As far as torques are concerned, you can imagine that the total weight is applied at the center of mass of the disc. So that's where gravity gets applied. Now, that can't be the only force on the disc. I mean, what else is touching the ball or disc? That would be the ramp itself. So the ramp is pushing on the disc and there's gotta be a component normal to the ramp, which I will call the normal force. So let me emphasize that the gravity force is applied at the center. And then there's one other force, think about it. Can either of these forces get this thing to roll? In order to get it to roll, you have to apply a, a clockwise torque on it. And you can see that the lever arm for both of these forces, the lever arm about the center of mass is zero. 
both the normal force and the gravity force. When you extend the line of action, here I didn't really need to because the arrows were drawn long enough already, but both of those, both of those lines of action actually pass through the center. So if I compute torques about this point, I will find that the torque from the normal force is zero and the torque from the gravity force is zero. So where is the force that gets this thing to turn? It's gotta be a force applied at the point of contact. And since we've already accounted for a ramp disc force that's normal, the only possibility is that it would be in this direction. And we recognize that as friction. What type of friction? It's not kinetic friction because we're supposed to be rolling without slipping. So it's that old thing that's a little confusing at first, but it is in fact static friction. Even though the disc is moving, it's still static friction because the point of contact is instantaneously at rest. Yes, in a moment, this point of contact will be moving because it's going to be rolling around the perimeter, but at this moment in time, the point of contact is stationary, and that's why we can call it static friction. We're just replacing the point of contact. So this is static friction. And I think we've identified all the forces and where they are applied. That means we can, we can calculate the torques as well. Okay, so since I've called down the ramp positive, static friction is going to get a negative sign. Also, let me break gravity into components. See that? We see that there is a component of gravity down the ramp. I didn't draw the arrows. I suppose I could do that here. Okay, what's this angle? We've seen this enough times now. I hope you remember that this is also theta. If the ramp's inclination is theta, so is this angle between gravity and the normal to the ramp. So if we take the gravity force mg, that's the hypotenuse of this right triangle, we can multiply by the sine of theta to get the opposite side. That's the component of gravity that points down the ramp. So I've got a positive mg sine theta, that's gravity's component down the ramp, minus the friction, and that's got to equal the mass of this ball or disc times its acceleration. And I'm just going to write find V, oh, I already did, right? Find the speed at the bottom. So it's, well, I'm not going to write out given with the brackets. Let's just assume that everything we need is given. And just like the previous problem, we're going to use the dynamics here to find the acceleration. Once we have the acceleration, we can use kinematics to find the accelerate, or excuse me, the speed at the bottom. Dynamics first, then kinematics. Have I written enough to solve for A? Well, presumably we would be given the mass and the angle, but if we were not given the static friction force, we're at a loss. We would have two unknowns. You know what, fine. Let's say you're given the mass of the disk, the radius of the disk, even that coefficient that describes its distribution of mass, in other words, the moment of inertia, and the height, fine, you want the angle too? We know all that stuff. Now find the speed at the bottom. Okay, where can we go to get the next equation? You can always try the y equation for Newton's second law. I don't expect there to be any acceleration perpendicular to the ramp because this thing is rolling down the ramp. So I think we can say that the normal force minus, well, let's see here. We want this component of the gravity force. Take the hypotenuse and multiply by the cosine of theta to get the adjacent side, minus mg cos theta. And I don't have to worry about the friction force because it has no component along the y-axis, the normal axis. All this equation does is tell me what the normal force is, but n does not appear here, so that's useless. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, can't we express the static friction force in terms of the normal force by saying static friction is equal to mu times the normal force? It's easy to fall in that trap. This is not true. Sometimes it's true. The equation is really that the um, static force, uh, what should I just say? The static friction force is less than or equal to mu times n. This is the max possible static friction force. But we don't even know if we need the max static friction force. All we need is enough to get this ball to roll. This has to be just enough to provide, to provide the torque that gets the ball rolling at just the right rate that it's rolling without slipping. So we cannot assume that static friction is mu times n. If we could, then I suppose we could plug that in here. 
and we would have our answer. So this condition is not going to tell us what the static friction force is. Where do we go? Of course, since this is chapter 12, we go to the torque equation. We'll say that the net torque on the disc is I alpha. So here's the subtle part that your book doesn't really prove. What I'm doing, because uh, a moment ago or earlier in this video, I said that you can use this equation if you're talking about a, a rigid object rotating about a fixed axis. Well, really, the axis is not fixed because you could imagine this disc or ball is rotating about an axis through its center, and that axis itself is translating down the ramp. Ugh. But um, the second result that I quoted from a more advanced mechanics class is that, for, at least for this situation, you can separate the total motion into two parts. There's the translation uh, of the center of mass, and then there's rotation about the center of mass. So as long as we apply this equation and calculate torques about the center of mass and the angular acceleration about the center of mass and the moment of inertia about the center of mass, then we're good. So let's do that using this picture. Okay, just like the previous problem, I'm calling down the ramp positive. Now, if the acceleration is down the ramp, wouldn't the angular acceleration be clockwise? As this thing rotates clockwise, it moves down the ramp. So I'm gonna eschew convention again, and this time consider clockwise torques to be positive so that I'm not um, fumbling the signs of my two accelerations. I want the signs to match. Okay, well, I think I've already explained that the torques due to the normal force and gravity are both zero because the lines of action pass through the, the center of mass. They have no lever arm. The only non-zero torque is the torque due to friction. And can you see that, that the torque is clockwise? Ask yourself which direction this friction force tends to rotate the disc, and that is, in fact, clockwise. And you can see that the, the radius from the center of the disc to where the, the static friction force is actually applied, it's already perpendicular to the force. So we can just use R perp. The torque is merely the radius of the disc times the static friction force, and that has to equal the moment of inertia, which I will write now as C times mass of the disc times R squared. I'm using that general expression where, you know, it could be a thin hoop, in which case C is one. It could be a solid disc, in which case C is one half or something in between. Okay, well, we've got two equations here. Here's equation one. Here's equation two. How many unknowns? We don't know static friction. We don't know A. We don't know alpha. I see the same three unknowns in these two equations, static friction, A, and alpha. We've got two equations and three unknowns, or do we? Arguably, we have a third equation, but translational acceleration is capital R times rotational acceleration. And again, this is for rolling without slipping. And you know what? I really skipped a step conceptually. Conceptually, What I showed you in a previous video is that the speed of the center of mass of the rolling disc is equal to the radius of the disc times the rotational speed of the disc. Well, if you take the, the time derivative of that whole equation, what's the rate of change of the velocity of the center of mass? That's the acceleration of the center of mass. R is a constant. Pull it out in front of the derivative. What's the rate of change of angular velocity? That would be angular acceleration. So this equation is also true if your disc or ball is rolling without slipping. And what I've done here is just dispense with the CM. It's understood that when we talk about the translational acceleration of the disc, we're really talking about this, the acceleration of the center of mass down the ramp. Because if you think about it, just pick one particle on the, the rim of the, um, of the disc there and watch its motion. It's actually tracing out a cycloid. If you bust open your calculus book, you can see how to express the cycloid parametrically using sine and cosine. It's pretty cool. I'm almost positive that's in your calculus book. Well, this is not circular motion. It's not linear motion. It's something, in not in between, but it's something altogether different. And you can see that it's got to have some sort of centripetal acceleration associated with it. Like when you're right here moving in that direction, there's probably an acceleration towards the center 
well, what exactly is the center? It's complicated is what I'm getting at. So we're not talking about the acceleration of any one particle on the edge of the disk. We're talking about the acceleration of the center of mass, but for this problem, we'll just call it A, okay? And we go back up to this equation now and recognize we can use one of the R's and clump it together with alpha and replace all that with just A. So I can, I can identify the linear acceleration here. And we'll have an R left over, won't we? And then there's the other R here. So let's just divide this whole equation by, I don't know how to write that. Divide by R. How did I write it in the previous problem? I don't even remember. Maybe I should just not write anything at all. I'm dividing R from this equation and I get this. I'm still looking at equation two. I'm just left with static friction equals C M alpha. And we can immediately confirm that at least the units come out right. Kilograms, meters per second squared, newtons, same thing. This constant is dimensionless. Okay, so it's actually the torque equation which has told us what the static friction force needs to be. And I think we could easily confirm that this is less than the max possible. The max possible would be mu times n, and you can see that that would be mu times mg cos. So presumably, this must be less than mu mg cos, because that's the greatest it could be using our simple model of static friction. Okay, let's take this and plug that in here. Instead of writing FS, we will use CMA, Country Music Awards. I've never seen that show. MG sine theta minus CMA. So I'm just substituting over here, equals MA, great. Hey, do you see how the M's cancel out? That seems to happen often. And I've got G sine theta equals C plus one times A. I factored out A on the right side. Looking for paper here. Let's solve for the acceleration. It's G sine theta over one plus C. And I'm actually, fine with uh, leaving it like this. I don't need to use the kinematics to find the speed at the bottom because we did that already. I think we did that. You know what, we better because last time I looked at this problem, uh, it was using energy conservation. There was no mention of acceleration. We did go directly to the speed. So fine, I'll do that. But I also want to take a look at the acceleration. Do you remember that for most of the semester, we just imagined that um, like a car sliding down an embankment or a block sliding down a ramp had an acceleration g sine theta if there's no friction. Well, we see that if the object has wheels that rotate, the, the acceleration is not so simple as g sine theta. It's reduced by this factor one plus c. And that is because, if you think about energy, some of the initial potential energy is being transformed into rotational energy. It's not all available for translation. So you won't expect the things, you won't expect the object's center of mass to, to pick up speed at the same rate translationally. And it's nice that it's such, such a simple result. And I think it's kind of fun to evaluate this for a sphere. Remember, for a spherical, a solid ball, if you roll a solid ball down a ramp, this coefficient is two-fifths. The moment of inertia of a sphere about its center of mass is two-fifths mR squared. So let's evaluate this for two-fifths. A is equal to G sine theta over one plus two-fifths. Well, that's five-fifths plus two-fifths, so seven-fifths. Seven-fifths in the denominator is five-sevenths out front. Cool. Kind of a fun fact. I have that memorized now because I've seen it a number of times. I don't think most physics students are aware that if you roll a solid ball down a ramp, doesn't actually pick up speed at the rate g sine theta. It's 5 sevenths g sine theta. And this number would be even different if it was a solid disk rather than a ball. It's kind of interesting though that it's a, a rational number out front, right? Integer over integer. How come it's not something like pi over the square root of two? Let's go back now to this result. Now that we know the acceleration, we can use kinematics to relate the speed at the end to these other quantities. Aha, yeah, let me finish this. I should get a blank piece of paper here. <clears throat> what is the displacement down the ramp? 
because we're not given that directly, are we? Let's look at this right triangle here. Um, I can express the sine of theta. Sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. That's H over delta X. So delta X, if I solve for delta X, that's actually H over sine theta. Let's use that in our kinematic relation here. If we start from rest, the speed at the top is zero. So V1 squared would be two times the acceleration. The acceleration we found is G sine theta over one plus C. Sorry, that's the, uh, the general result. And then the displacement delta X I just found was H over sine theta. So that's how these signs cancel. And I find that the speed at the bottom is merely root 2GH over 1 plus C. And that's the result that we saw in a previous video. That time we used energy conservation. Always satisfying to see that we get the same result either way. You can use the dynamics, which is the, what I would call the differential form of Newton's mechanical theory, or you can use energy conservation, which is the integrated form. You've already taken F equals MA and integrated it.